Amen. Thank you, James. That song takes me back to Pensacola Christian College where I received my education. That's the only place I've ever heard that song being played. Yeah, it's the blast from the past for me. So yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, James, for playing for us. Thank you, Wanda, for playing the organ for us. Uh, thank you, Susan, at the sound booth. Appreciate your ministry. Uh, it's always wonderful to, to to have people doing what they that they feel led to do for the Lord. So it's wonderful. If you have your Bibles close at hand, Jeremiah chapter number one is where we're at today. We're in the series on the book of Jeremiah, so we've been plugging through uh, chapter number one for a couple weeks now, and I believe, Lord willing, that tonight we'll be finishing with chapter one of Jeremiah. We'll begin in verse number 11 through uh, 19, and if you could, uh, if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. All right. Start in verse number 11, go to verse 19. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, See What, what seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot. And the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord. And they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah." And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and, ha and have burned incense unto other gods, and worship the works of their own hands. Thou therefore gird up thy loins, and arise, speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, an iron pillar, a brazen and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the message tonight. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We ask you to use it tonight to encourage us to be more like Christ, to go forward and be faithful in, in what you have given to us. Father, we ask you to help us. May our distractions in our minds be done away with. May our focus be on you. And may you help this preacher to fade away, and may what is seen is the Word of God. And Father, we thank you so much for this night. May you bless each person here. I do pray, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's an interesting thing, as we've been looking at the book of Jeremiah, uh, that it, it's interesting that God doesn't necessarily tell Jeremiah all the ins and outs of his ministry. In fact, if uh, I'm sure if a pastor or a preacher or a missionary knew all the ins and outs about everything that God called them to, they might reconsider the things that they went that they're going to have to go through. I think of that of uh, Charles Spurgeon. He's a prince of preachers there in Great Britain, and uh, he is absolutely a phenomenal preacher in that when he was 19, he became the pastor of a great uh, huge church and uh, de definitely the mega church of his day. Uh, but then one day, what happens to him changes his life dramatically, and he's never the same from that point forward. What happens is that he was in preaching in a building, then some people that didn't like his ministry shouted, Fire! Fire! And so everybody in their rush left, tried to go to the exits. People were trampled, some to death. 
And from hearing that some people died because of the impact of that, Charles Spurgeon um, actually fainted, and people actually thought he had died as well. But yeah, he recovered, but yet he, he was still, in a way, haunted by the realization of what, uh, what that night had done to him, knowing that people had died uh, that was at his church. Some people... If some missionaries, if they knew what was going to happen to them, they might reconsider. And so just thinking about that. One pastor especially caught my eye when I was learning about him. His name is Charles Simeon. He's another uh, British pastor. And he was a unique guy in that he was at his church for 54 years. And so what a wonderful testimony that is. And uh, half of the time, I would say, his people did not want him. This is back in the day where he was part of the church denomination that they appointed people to be the pastor of whatever church that needed him. And so they specifically wanted him to be the pastor of uh, the church that is connected with Cambridge University. And so he said, okay, that's great. So he goes, and the people of the congregation, they don't want him. In fact, they have their own pastor that they go and hear Uh, in the evening service instead of him. And so for years and years, and they got so vicious at times. This is back in the day where where there was pews, and the family owned the pews, and so they didn't want uh, the people for this church to grow any, so they locked the pews in order for people not to sit there, and they wouldn't be there themselves. And so what he did is, okay, well, I'm going to have chairs. And so he had chairs all throughout the, uh, the aisles where there was no pews. And so, ever, so it actually grew from that point forward. Now, he went through a lot of reject, rejection and definitely uh, understanding that and seeing um, uh, what he went through, 54 years of that. I think, wow, you had perseverance. Uh, but yet, yeah, he went through because he knew it was God's will. And so people go through some tough times, uh, but yet God can get them through the tough times. The song that we just sang, It Is Well With My Soul, written by Horatio, Horatio uh, G. Spatford. He was a wealthy guy, the Uh, There happened to be a fire in the city he was in. It was Chicago, the great Chicago fire. And what he did is that he uh, basically just about bankrupt himself in trying to rebuild Chicago. And knowing that he needed a vacation, he said, okay, uh, for his wife to take uh, his three uh, uh, daughters and uh, to go to uh, Great Britain, and uh, he would join them a little bit later. So they went by ship, which is the usual of that day. And unfortunately, when in the midst of that, something happened, the ship sank. And then she arrives in Great Britain and writes to him, saved, alone. And then, as... Spatford understood that his daughters were were gone. He went to go and reunite with his wife, and uh, the captain of the ship said, okay, uh, when they went, got to a certain position, they went to him and said, this is the place where the ship went down. And so him, as he's in his thoughts, he went to his, his cabin and got a pen and paper out and wrote down, it is well, it is well with my soul. And so we know that when Satan buffets, and our trials seem so long, but yet it is well, it is well with my soul. Jeremiah is an interesting prophet because there's a lot of bad things that will happen to him in his ministry. And there's no if and or buts about that because he goes through a period of darkness that no other prophet goes through because his task is to tell the nation of Judah that you either ship up or shape or ship shape up or ship out. There you go. Uh, <laughs> that's what Pastor Lapino labeled uh, the book of Jeremiah. So I, I always like that uh, description of it: either uh, shape up or ship out. Did I get it right? Okay, good, good. So we have, uh, we have Jeremiah, and his prophecies, like, like we saw last time, is mostly negative. It's going to be mostly 
them, him denouncing the nation because of their idolatry. And true enough, they are on the precipice of Babylon coming in and taking them out. And by the end of his book, here, here's a spoiler for you. If you don't know how Jeremiah ends, everything happens the way that God has warned them that it was going to happen. Babylon comes in and they are uh, driven away. Babylon or Jerusalem itself is destroyed. And then the rest of the people go into captivity, the Babylonian captivity for 70 years, according to what Jeremiah says. So this is a bit of a dark book, but yet we know that God will help him through. And so tonight we're going to go through the last part about uh, Jeremiah's calling. We'll, you know, last time we saw the very first part where, where Jeremiah says, I am but a child, but now we're going to go at the last part of it and talk about three specific encouraging thoughts for us as we go and walk with the Lord and do all that we can for the cause of the kingdom that we will persevere to the end just like Jeremiah. So here's three encouraging thoughts for us to ponder tonight. First of all, number one, God will fulfill all his promises. Notice with me in verse number 11, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Verse 12, Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Now, you might ask me the question of, okay, almond tree. Does that represent anything uh, about that of uh, what God has said, that he will hasten to perform it? Well, sort of. There are only two places where the word almond is used in the King James. Uh, this is the second time that's used. Uh, the first time... I escaped my memory. Uh, first time is used in a negative sense. Oh, yes. It's talking about that of a... Uh, uh, that in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, where it talks about um, old age, that this is a sign of old age, that of a, an, like an almond tree, that with white. Uh, so understandably, so that's the only other place that almond is used. So I'm like, well, that doesn't give me any help uh, understanding this text. But the word itself that's used gives the indication because the word for almond tree is very close uh, connection to the word haste. In fact, in the almond tree, when you see uh, this is the first um, tree that actually produces fruit in its season. During the time of winter, people will have hope for the coming harvest and that it will start doing what it needs to do in order to produce uh, the results for the fruit itself in springtime. It is the first, first tree, first thing that produces anything in spring. And so when he sees the almond tree, uh, then God has produced a, a harvest, a fruit. And so he says, I will hasten to perform all my word. Isn't that comforting to think about that God will not neglect his word? What he says he will do. In fact, one of the signs of a false prophet is if anybody comes in the Lord's name, and what he says does not come to pass, then he should die. And in fact, in Jeremiah, we have a lot of false prophets that we will see throughout the book. Uh, one person specifically, it was named uh, Pas Pasher. Uh, his, his thing was that uh, he was trying to give hope to the people. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar already came through once, and, and so they're kind of down. And so he's going to give a prophecy, thus saith the Lord, that within, I think it was two years, they, the, the people that went away into captivity will come back. And Jeremiah says, nope, that's not what the word, word of the Lord says. And so Jeremiah goes away from him, and the Lord says, okay, go back and tell him this. Okay, thus saith the Lord, Pasher, you have one year to live, and you're going to die. Thus saith the Lord. And within the year, that person dies because of him speaking falsely in the name of the Lord. Everything that God says will happen, happens. You know, you can put, put you know, everything of your trust upon God's word will 
happen. And there are so many things that we are encouraged about in God's word that will happen. It's promises given to us about what it is that he's going to do. First of all, I think that of salvation through Christ. We take God at his word, and if his word is false, then we have no hope whatsoever. If our hope is based on the word of God and God can lie, which he can't, then we have absolutely no hope. But because we know God can't lie, everything that we know from the word of God will happen. And so notice with me what it says, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Question, does God keep his word? Absolutely. So this is true if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. If we have accepted him as our own personal savior, this is true of us. John chapter 14, verse number six, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's not what uh, Muslims think. That's not what Buddhists think. That's not what Hindus think. That's not what Jewish people think, at least the, the ones that reject Christ. Is this true? Absolutely, there is no other way besides Christ that you can get right with God the Father. In 1 John chapter number 5, verses 11 through 12, it says, And this is the record that God have, hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Is this true? You better believe it. He that has the Son has life. If you have received Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, you have everlasting, eternal, never-ending life. In John chapter 1, verse number 12 through 13, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of, the, of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. God keeps his word and so our basis of salvation is God's word alone, and based on God's character also. We see the salvation through Christ, but also the forgiveness of sins is according to God's word. Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. If you believe that God has forgiven your sins, and if you're in Christ, yes, he has then we need to take God at his word. God never lies. He always fulfills his word. How about that of the gift of the Holy Spirit? We have so many things about the gift of the Holy Spirit that we have based solely on God's word. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of, the tr word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I love this. This, this actually sealed for me, uh, in my mind, the fact that you can never lose your salvation. Before this point, I, I had some doubts, but this sealed it for me. Ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. We, have the, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit promise based on God's word, and God always fulfills his promises. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 13 through 14, it says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. He is working on me to make me more and more like Jesus Christ. And it's based solely upon his word. And God always fulfills his promises. Romans chapter 8, verse number 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, some people want to say that this is speaking in tongues. No, it's not. It is understanding that God, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to God, the Father, in such a way that we cannot understand what he's saying. We cannot understand the depths and the, and the heights of all that the Holy Spirit is uttering to God the Father. Just an amazing thing. We have the intercession of the Holy Spirit. We have the intercession of God the Son on our behalf as well. But that's not true unless God can 
fulfill all his promises. That is crucial. God fulfills all of his promises. In John chapter 14, verse 17, it says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The very fact that the Holy Spirit indwells me is solely based on the word of God, and God always fulfills his promises. We see that of the new nature in Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's not by a, uh, a, a, uh, reformation of the habits that we have in order to earn our salvation. No, we have salvation through Christ, but because we are saved, he is working on us and has given us that new nature in Christ. And as much as we yield to the Holy Spirit, as much as we submit to the Lord, he helps us to continue to grow and grow and grow in likeness of Christ. We have a new body that is waiting for us. If uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The fact that I could say that when I die, I know I'm going to get a new body it is solely based on God's word and God fulfills all of his promises. Not only that, you think about that of the new home that we'll have. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let, us n let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I love the, the fact that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Notice this, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We have a new home waiting for us. When Jesus Christ comes down in the clouds of glory, he will then receive the church to himself. For those who are dead will rise again. And those who of, of us that are alive and remain will be caught up in the air with him. And yes, before the tribulation starts, <laughs> before the tribulation starts, we're out of here. Uh, God's going to once again deal with his nation Israel at the tribulation time. But we'll come back when it's time for Jesus to uh, set up his kingdom on earth. We will be one of those that are clothed in, in white uh, raiment, uh, ones that are on white horses. You know, I rode a horse one time in my life, and I hated it. But I'm thinking that at this point in time, I'm going to love every minute of it. So praise the Lord for all of, his, uh, all of his promises to us. And I love the next verse right after this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 18. says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You cannot comfort anybody unless God fulfills all his promises. For each and every one of us, we're basing everything on the word of God because we know God does, he fulfills all his promises. Uh, now, secondly, not only does he fulfill all his promises, and now follow me with this, God will fulfill all his promises. Well, you just said the same exact thing. That's that. Even the negative ones. You know, the list that we had before, those are very positive. Those are very positive. Every one of them is just teeming with, you know, salvation, that of glorification, that of sanctification, all of these things, the gift of the Holy Spirit, all of these are very, very positive, but yet we have to also take the negative along with. Uh, notice with me what it says here in Jeremiah. He says, verse number 12, Then said the Lord, or verse number 13, And the Lord, word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants 
of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they will, shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. Here we see this very interesting thing. Uh, verse number 16 shows you why. And I will utter my uh, judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. You might say, well, what in the world is that? A, a, bowl, uh, a boiling pot, a seething pot. He sees something that's going to come from the north. It's an interesting thing about knowing history and knowing what will transpire because what will transpire is that God has already, already said what he's going to do. In the time of Hezekiah, years before this point in time, um, Isaiah meets Hezekiah. Unfortunately, he has met somebody else on the way. He had some messengers from Babylon that wanted to say yay for him to, to get better because he was sick nigh unto death. In fact, he was going to die, but he persuaded God not to uh, take his life at that point in time. Isaiah comes to Hezekiah, sees the messengers from Babylon. Hezekiah, what have these people seen? And he said, well, I showed them everything. Every little bit of my kingdom, all the glory that I have, all the, the armory, all the gold, all the silver, all everything. Okay. Thus saith the Lord, because you have done this, everything that you own will go to Babylon. And lo and behold, we have an army from the north, a seething pot from the north, ready to invade the land, and that's Babylon. You might say, well, Babylon, and just looking at it, um, here, let me pull up a picture that isn't quite in the right place. Okay, there we go. Um, this is a picture of exactly where Babylon is to Judah. So Judah is on the left side, if you're looking at it. Babylon is straight east, or yeah, straight east. You go to Babylon. So why is it from the north? Well, here's what happens. They go from Babylon, and they go north. And then they reach the north, and they go then from the north down south to invade Judah. And exactly as the Lord predicts is going to happen, Nebuchadnezzar will take that northern route and take a, to, from the north, then come and invade the land, and they will be um, taken and everything about everything that he just says will come to pass. The t setting his throne at the entering of the gate, what Nebuchadnezzar does eventually is take the king of Judah and then send him to Babylon and then sets up his own puppet government in the gates of the city of Jerusalem. Everything that he says will come to pass, even the negative ones. And so we, we see this and... Uh, and so first we understand that Jeremiah has a negative thing to say to the, the nation of Judah. But yet, thinking about our own selves, here's, an, I, here's some negative promises that God keeps for us. First of all, we see that of divine discipline on disorderly disciples. I know that's all alliterated. That's the only one. Uh, <laughs> divine discipline on disorderly disciples. These are promises of God, just like the positive ones were. And so we see in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 5 through 7, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? I have uh, five children, and I chasten them when they need to be chastened. I discipline them when they need to be disciplined. And uh, true enough, through the ages when they were babies up to uh, now one's almost a teenager. And so we have different disciplines for each one of the kids. 
And it's, it's an amazing transition of going from, okay, they're, they're, they're small, they're small, I can discipline them one way, and then it gets through to them, well, I discipline them a different way now, uh, knowing they're what they will endure versus that which will crush their uh, desires of, uh, oh, you want to play video games and, and all that stuff. So I'm like, oh, you don't get to play that today. So with each different phase that they go through, they have different disciplines. For a child of God, if God disciplines us, if we've been going off astray a little bit and God says no and restricts either the blessings that he is promising us, that he wants to give us, or brings upon us something that is uh, very negative in our life to get our attention back on the Lord, it is a good thing. Just as an earthly father would chasten his own son, God the heavenly father chastens us when we deserve it. In verse number 11 of Hebrews chapter 12, now no chastening for the present seemeth, seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Uh, nevertheless, uh, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And if a, a believer uh, does not come back to Christ, does not come back to God in the discipline that he uh, endures and becomes more and more and more um, stout-hearted, more and more hard-hearted to the Lord than the possibility of the Lord taking them home prematurely. First John chapter 5, verse 16, If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Notice this. There is a sin unto death, and I do not say that he shall pray for it. If a believer is so wayward in what they're actually should be doing, and God has chastised that person to try to get them back into good folds with the Lord, eventually they get to a situation that God says, All right, you're done. You're going to come home because you have reached that point and it's time to go. So divine discipline on disorderly disciples, this is a promise from God that if we stray from the way we ought to go, he will also um, discipline us to get back on the right path. Not only that, but that lack of reward in the future. We know the judgment seat of Christ is there where we're going to give an account for what we have done here and now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we see a, a, a picture of it. For our other salvation can no man lay, that is, that is laid, which is Christ Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built, hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Notice this. If a man, any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So if a person does not do the will of God here and now, the negative results is there's nothing to show for what they have in eternity. It's a lack of reward in the future. But not only that, but we also see a lack of fruit of the Spirit now. In Galatians chapter number 6, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh, uh, shall reap co corruption, but he that sow to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Talking about that of lack of fruit of the Spirit now, if we're not doing all the things that God wants us to do, if we're not walking closer and closer with Him, we will lack the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Joy. In fact, a lot of times when a Christian has lack of joy, he's usually pretty pretty far away you know it says in the presence of god is the fullness of joy just an amazing thought the more and more we get closer and closer with god the more joyful we should be but yet then if we stray away the lack of joy lack of peace lack of uh, patience which all of us need especially on on 27 uh, <laughs> just an amazing thing 
patience and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and, uh, and self-control. We, we see all these things. But yet, if we are not close with God, we will lack the fruit of the Spirit now. These are the negative promises that God has for us. So first of all, number one, we see God, God will fulfill all his promises. That's encouraging. Number two, God will fulfill all his promises, even the negative ones. That is still encouraging because we know, okay, if we do stray, he will get us back. Last but not least, God will fulfill all his promises, even with our help. It's an amazing thing to think about that God calls us to do good works. Just amazing. God doesn't need our help. Amen. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is, is fully capable of doing all the things, but yet he wants us to be involved in the ministry he gives us. Notice with me what it says there about Jeremiah. Verse number 17, Thou therefore gird up the, thy loins and arise. Speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound them thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Just an amazing thing to hear. Jeremiah, at this point in time, we, we talked about last time how old he is. He's probably in his teenage, if not to, in his 20s, maybe. Uh, he is but a child in that he doesn't know the rhetoric. He doesn't know the, the how to communicate as a priest. He is in the priestly line, though he was not yet trained to be that. And so he says, I am but a child. God then puts forth his hand and touch his mouth and says, I have put my word in your mouth. Now, specifically, his ministry is going to tell people the hard truth that's not going to want to hear it. In fact, we get that list here in verse number 18. Against the kings of Judah. Those are the ones in charge. Against the princes thereof. Those are the ones that are just beneath us. Against the priests thereof. That's the religious part about uh, Judah and against the people of the land. Boy, how mu many people are going to be against him? It sounds like everybody, uh, from the top government official all the way down to the religious leaders, all the way down to all the people, they will be against you. Boy, you would love that that ministry, right? Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna talk and no one's gonna listen to you. You're gonna even talk and everybody's gonna be against you. But here is the greatest promise in Scripture. We see this in verse number nineteen. They shall fight against thee. That's that's a bummer of a statement. That this will happen, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord. I am with you. So you speak the word of the Lord to the nation of Judah. They don't listen. God's with them. The priests are coming against him, wanting him to stop preaching. God's with them. The kings themselves don't want to listen to Jeremiah. God's with them. Uh, when, the, uh, when the princes come and say that we need to kill Jeremiah, God's still with them. Every single time that, that people have uh, anger against Jeremiah, has ill will towards Jeremiah, God is with them every single time to deliver them out of their hands. God is with Jeremiah. He makes a similar promise with us. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We can go through all the trials and tribulations that we have in store for us. And true enough, if you are alive, you're going to go through some trials and tribulations. That's just the matter of life. This is an imperfect world because it's a sin-cursed world. Everything about it has been touched with the reality of death and sin. But yet we are encouraged each and every day. Though our outward man perish, our inward is renewed day by day. 
And if God be for us, who can be against us? Yes, I understand that, uh, that our, our government is not particularly for Christians these days. Uh, in fact, I can foresee a time that within my lifetime that perhaps uh, things will happen for our, against our church that seem like insurmountable odds. Um, in fact, I have heard somebody say, oh, what we need to do is take away all tax exemption from all religious institutions. That means we have to pay taxes on this land. <laughs> I could see that happening. But yet, God is with us. If God be with us, what can man do? Well, he could destroy the outward, but lo and behold, who has control over what we do and how we die? It's God. It's God all the way. It's an amazing thing to think about. God wants to work in us, wants to work through us to do all that he has in store for us. In Philippians chapter number 2, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye all have always obeyed, not, as not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's working on me so that I might be more and more like Jesus Christ. I work not because I need to earn my own salvation, because Jesus Christ earned it for me. And by faith, I put my faith on Christ, and now Christ is working on me, so that because I am saved, I now work and do the things that God wants me to do. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God wants us to do the things that he wants us to do. He has called us to do and be what we ought to be. We talked about this morning about being a witness. We talked about this morning about being like Christ to those around us so that we can shine the light in the darkness of this world and so by they can turn from darkness to light, from death to to life. Amazing that we have this ministry of reconciliation. And I love the fact that God is in control of our lives even, even when we die. Psalm 116, verse number 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. There are so many times in church history that Christians died. I think of that of uh, Polycarp. He was the uh, uh, bishop of Smyrna in the second century. And uh, he, huh, they got him on being an atheist because they, he discredited all the gods of Rome except for Jesus. He would not turn on Jesus. And so what happened is that they decided to burn him at the stake. And uh, they did all that they needed to do, lit the fire, but then God made a miracle that... He was not, he was surrounded by this kind of bubble, and so the fire didn't kill him. And so, when ordered to, this soldier went and run him through with a javelin. He died. Then we have the Fox's Book of Martyrs, all these different people that died in very painful, ugly ways, with that of the mouth of the lion, with that of gladiators, that of being stretched into two. Uh, so many things uh, that is terrible but yet god knows them all precious in his sight is the death of his saints and even if we give our lives for christ it will be worth it all when we see jesus i think of the uh, five missionaries went to uh to ecuador to to reach the alka indians a savage group that killed everybody that came near them so they went and uh, tried to to win them to Christ, and it cost them their very lives. But yet God knew all about that, and God prepared for ministry a widow of one of the uh, martyrs, Elizabeth Elliot, and I believe it was the sister of another, to go in, and they reached that tribe for Christ. And to this day, now they are a Christian tribe. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Nate Saint, uh, who is the, uh, the 
uh, one of the missionaries that were martyred, his son Steve, uh, went in and has become part of the tribe. And the person that killed his father became sort of a surrogate father for him. Only Christ can do that. Only Christ. So even if we pay with our own lives for the cause of the cross, the cause of the gospel, it is precious, valuable in his sight. So here's what we ought to do. Take heart, be encouraged, and do all that God wants us to do. If we do all that God wants us to do, it's really up to him what, what we're going to go through, what we have in store for us. And specifically in the future, we could see how many lives we can touch for the cause of Christ. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this night that you have given us. We rejoice in your word. Father, we know that you will fulfill all your promises, that you will give us a home in heaven, that if we're in Christ, we are a new creature that it will eventually become the reality fully with a new body, a new nature. And even though we have all these promises, and even though things might go wrong for us today in our lives, help us to walk closer and closer with you. Help us to have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And may we be the lights we need to be in the darkness of this world. I do pray, in Jesus' name, amen.